Hi, we continue in Luke 15 today. As the son has taken all the property that was his from his father, squandered it, and found himself amidst of a famine with nothing. And so as we see on the left side of the screen, we're going to begin where he came to himself and came up with a new plan. But before we get there, I need to situate us where we are, not only in our story, but in this unit. And I also like to go back to the beginning of our unit a little bit to pause to consider what I rushed through pretty quickly in the first few verses to get the prodigal son to this bottom place. So uh, first, let's look, as we can see on the right side of the screen, if you haven't been following these videos, I encourage you to go back and see the introduction to the unit 15.1 to 17.10, which explains some things about how these pieces fit together. But for now, I just want to highlight a couple elements. One is that we saw in the preface that two pairs of groups are listening to these stories. The tax collectors and sinners who are coming to listen, which is what Jesus had told people to do in the previous verse, the end of chapter 14, and the Pharisees and the scribes who are grumbling about it. And even though it's a Pharisee's house, it's hosting the meal at which these um, stories are being told. And one thing I want to highlight also is that we're looking at 1511 to 1613 as a unit. So it's often the case that people see chapter 15 as a unit, the two stories about lost things, the sheep and the coin, along with the story of the lost son. But for reasons I looked at last time, and I'll show you briefly again today because it's relevant to our immediate passage, uh, really there's a pairing between this story and the story of the manager of injustice in the next uh, chapter, in 16. And here's some of what we can see as the unit. Both of them involve the problem of squandered property. In this case, it's a fact, and in the next one, it's a charge. It's brought rumors about it. And each of them, they come up with a plan speaking to themselves. So we see this one here that we're going to look at today, and you see on the left side of the screen, and we'll see this one in the next situation. And both end on a positive note with some kind of celebration, at least the first half of the story here, which is the part that fits the chiasm that goes up through here uh, that we looked at before. This chiasm, by the way, is from Bailey, and it's not a perfect chiasm any more than the chiasm of the whole journey that we looked at is perfect. You notice it's not verbal, it's thematic. And one of the elements that's not perfect we'll look at today is whether this is really great repentance or not, or whether it's something short of repentance. Metanoia uh, or metanoia, the noun and verb for repentance are not used here. So we can't assume that, and many scholars disagree about that. Um, so we see those connections in the, in the shaping of it. And we'll also see, while I'm still here, that the heart of the matter of this entire unit is one cannot serve two lords, God and mammon, at which point the Pharisees are characterized as silver lovers, which, as I've been noting, makes them a stand-in for Luke's audience of young elite Romans. The elite Romans not really being concerned about a group of Pharisees who are irrelevant to their life. Um, so those are aspects of this we, the bigger section that we need to be looking at. But also some of the ways to read this section. And I just want to go over this briefly. I went over it in more detail last time. We've already seen some examples of how we can read this all as an allegory for the reunion of Ephraim, which is, say, Israel, the northern kingdom of what had been the two kingdoms of Israel and Judah in the time long before the Romans and the, in the time of the Israelite monarchy and afterward in the Judahite monarchy. Uh, and then... And we see in Hosea, which we can look at here, Hosea 11, a little narrative in Yahweh's voice of Israel being a child loved by Yahweh. And it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. But at the end we hear, I will turn them to their homes, says Yahweh, from Assyria. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies in the house of Israel's deceit. But Judah still walks with God and is faithful to the Holy One. Which would highlight that Judah would fit the elder son here and Ephraim um, the prodigal son. Um, and yet, that's only one way of hearing the story. Uh, another way we can hear it uh, in the immediate context that we've been looking at is the Pharisees as the elder son, those who feel like they've been good all along. And we saw the parallel with that last time when we looked at the tax collector and Pharisee prayer story uh, later in Luke, um, where the Pharisees' prayers, I'm not like these other people. Um, and so we see how that's uh, fitting, and it's also how the Pharisees are um, self-justifying, as we see uh, in the unit in chapter 16 that follows their being called silver lovers. So that's another way to read it, as, as a dynamic about the characters in the story. Another way, and I really want to highlight this today, uh, as we go back to the beginning, is a story about how the mammon of injustice can divide people while the gift economy can reunite them. So let's go back up to the beginning uh, now that I've done that to see what I'm talking about. So right after the beginning, we heard the man had two sons, and the younger one makes his immediate demand, give me the share of the property that will belong to me, so he divided the property. And I noted briefly last time two different words for property here. And really, it's a different down here. So this one 
is usia, and it's only here in the next verse in the New Testament. But usia uh, doesn't just mean property, it means substance, and that's how it could be translated, though I share of the substance. But substance as in a person's substance, as in the term homoousia, which became the key term in the arguments in the fourth century of the Common Era around the Nicene and other creeds, around the very nature of Jesus in relation to God. Homoousia meaning of the same being. And so in that sense, usia has to do with one's essence or one's being. And the second one here, bios, similarly. We see bias a number of times, and I won't go back to look at all the times, but it, it can be used both in terms of one's material substance, uh, as in the um, seed parable about choked by the pleasures of the bias of this life, but also uh, one's substance materially or one's essence. And so really what we're hearing is the son's demand divides the essence of this family and divides his own essence up. Yes, it divides the property, but it divides the essence. And it leaves him, when we get to where we are here, with nothing. Um, no one gave him anything. So the uh, mammon of injustice, if you will, or the imperial economy, divides people up and leaves some with nothing. And what we'll see in the second half of the story, we won't see it today, but we'll see it in the next half of the video, making for this interpretation, is how the father gives him things for free, the, the robe and the ring and the, and the sandals, but also the feast and his love. And so we'll see the contrast between the gift economy or the religion of creation economy with the mammon of injustice or the imperial economy. And another way uh, to look at it, of course, the most popular way, certainly in recent uh, decades, is the way Henry Nouwen revealed in, in his book on this that I showed last time, I won't show it again, so tightly connected to his experience of the Rembrandt painting, which comes up today, and uh, here it is to see. But when we get to the story, I'd like to show something a little different, because perhaps this one has been seen too many times. Although, if you're interested, I posted last time uh, something from the Nouwen Society's discussion questions to work with the painting and the text. So that's posted at Radical Bible. Bible.net. Uh, and of course, that's a story, as now in notes, in which readers uh, throughout the ages can identify with any of the characters uh, in a given point in their life. But again, in the red, I want to highlight this is not a story of Jews who follow the law and stubbornly refuse, whereas Gentiles are welcomed. Uh, that's completely foreign to our context here. Um, so, uh, with all that in mind, let's put up the key words, which I've noted before, really in this section is just about fathers and son and celebrating. Um, so, let's uh, move down to our verse 17 and see our passage here. And as we do, as he comes to himself, let's consider a couple of things. Um, uh, as Bailey noted half a century ago, and I do note that in the introductory video to this unit, I noted all the recent scholarship uh, in the last couple of decades, but still Bailey from half a century ago is the go-to for virtually all all uh, scholars, even if they disagree with little details. And that comes out of Bailey's many years and decades of experience living in the Middle East and being a scholar there and experiencing how people actually lived in contrast to so many scholars and people like me who are sitting comfortably in America and have no clue of what the Middle Eastern life is like on the ground. Um, so he noted that this is not repentance as such, but simply recognition that his hunger had no further options while in the distant land. Um, Selu, more recent scholar, noting that instead of signaling repentance, the phrase here means something like, the son came to and said to himself, is another way for Luke to introduce inner debate. And we see that same inner debate in the shrewd manager story, uh, or the manager of injustice story, and nobody thinks of that as repentance, and it's almost the exact same language. So he came to himself, and this is what he thought. How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger? Now, that could be true, but not necessarily dictate his outcome. And it's worth considering for a moment, what are his choices? We tend to read the story as if what he does is inevitable, but it's far from inevitable. He could certainly stay where he is. Is he literally dying of hunger? Is everybody in his region dying of hunger? Would people just let him just simply die of hunger? Maybe he's a stranger in the land, um, but perhaps there's some kind of work he can get. Um, and uh, certainly not everybody who's a refugee or something is necessarily dying. So he certainly must have some kind of local options. Uh, he could go back and simply confess. He could not ask to be treated like a hired hand, and we'll look at that word in a minute. He could simply say, I've done a terrible thing, Father, and I hope you'll forgive me. 
but he certainly suspects reasonably so that when he left home he burned the bridges behind him and not only his father but his elder brother and all the neighbors and family would throw stones at him when he came back and and sneer at him and jeer and wonder why he dared to show his face back again after being such a disgrace to his family and to the whole neighborhood although we don't know what kind of a neighborhood it is um, so we don't know how viable that option is but he doesn't even consider it uh, so let's look more closely at what he actually says how many of my father's hired hands? Which is to highlight a lot of them. There must be a lot of them. If he's suggesting that some of them have bread to spare, although perhaps there's some who don't, it's not clear what distinction he's making. He doesn't say all of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but how many? And the how many, pasas here, is a word that will be echoed into the story of the unjust manager next time when he says, how many, how much do you owe my master? <clears throat> and he'll reduce the amounts. So another way that's being echoed. Um, the term for hired hands here, though, in a 19 is really important. Mythios, literally it has to do with a term that's used as a noun for reward, one who gets rewarded. Uh, but as a number of scholars note, the lowest class of people associated uh, with his family of origin, uh, as opposed to slaves. But even a slave has some kind of security. A hired hand is somebody who could be hired for day labor and then not hired tomorrow. The kind of people that one might see at the local hardware store waiting to see if someone could hire them. Or the kind of people we see in Matthew, in Matthew's story of the workers in the vineyard, when they need more workers in the middle of the day and go back and find a few more. So this is like the hourly wage people at the bottom of, of the scale. And he says, yet even them have enough bread as a symbol for food, and we see below all the uses of bread uh, in Luke, to spare, which is to say, uh, perisuzante, which is to say an abundance. It's more than just to spare. This is an expression of abundance. Um, and so have bread in abundance, but in contrast, I am dying of hunger. And the word isn't dying. Apolumai here means perishing or loosening. Um, so here I am perishing of hunger. So it's not literally dying any more than perhaps Esau was dying of hunger when he came in from the hunt unsuccessfully and, and wanted some of the red stuff that his brother Jacob had been preparing. Uh, but it's hard to say um, just how hungry he is. But he's certainly um, experiencing the famine and experiencing the desperation. So he comes up with a plan. And his soliloquy here makes a little chiasm, which I can put up on the screen so you can see. A nice, tight little chiasm there framed around the repeating of his confession and the cho choice to get up and go. So let's look at the details here. The phrase, um, get up and go, which includes um, anasis for rising here, although as Marshall notes, is an Aramaic phrase, meaning I will go at once. So it, it carries a little bit of resurrection um, uh, echo there, but it also is just a phrase for get going. I will say to my father, and I go to my father and say to him, Father. And in contrast to what we saw at the beginning, where the Greek had father twice in a row, once in the narrator and once in the voice, here there's a space between it, indicating there's now a distance between them. And if that seems like an obscure detail, that's how these texts work. By putting the two fathers with the space between, it's a note that they're not right next to each other. So this is what he's planning to say. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Um, and as Ramsey notes, the confession of sin is not what he said in candid reflection to himself, but what he proposes in his mind to say in direct speech to his father. In the narrator's skillful portrayal, then, the confession of sin is one step removed from the reliable candor of interior monologue. And if we know what's really going on here is where in the depth of the story is, this is Jesus quoting a character, quoting himself speaking in the future. Um, and so Jesus and, and Luke have really brought us deep into the story. So this is what he says, Father, I have sinned, um, which is curiously uh, one of only a couple of uses of the verb form to sin, hamartao, here and its re repetition at the other side of the chiasm in 21, and then in 17, 3 and 4, a number of uh, several links that connect um, the first part of chapter 17, which is why our unit goes all the way to 17:10. So I've sinned against heaven, uh, echoing Pharaoh from Exodus 10 that you can see below, where Pharaoh says, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. One of a number of echoes of the Egypt story, both from Exodus and the Joseph uh, story in Egypt from Genesis. And I didn't follow that here, um, but perhaps that's something you'd like to follow sometimes, the connections in the story and why Lucas put so many Egypt connections in the story.
Um, sinned against heaven and before you. Notice not sinned against you, but before you. Anopian in the Greek, I didn't note it here, but it's the same thing repeated there. So I've sinned against heaven and before you. But notice God isn't mentioned. There's no sense of, of God anywhere in this story. And so he, so this is um, his confession. And he also continues the confession this way. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And, um, Okate, um, for no longer will be repeated in his, you know, in the actual forming of it in out loud in 21, and then once also in chapter 20. Um, but worthy makes this part of honor shame, axios here, and we've seen it a few other times. And so, what is it that makes someone worthy to be called a son? Um, that's a question the text doesn't answer. Is the elder son, who we'll look at later, worthy to be called a son? Or is a son just a son by being a son? Is it something one has, a status one has to earn? Or is it something one has? In terms of the honor-shame code, we can distinguish that between um, ascribed and inherent. Uh, something that you uh, earn and you get by acts of beneficence or otherwise, or things that are just part of who you are uh, because of your class or ethnicity or things like that. Uh, I'm sorry, the distinction is between ascribed and acquired. Um, ascribed is what you already have, and acquired is what you gain. So it's a question, but in his mind, he understands that it's something to be earned, and he no longer is worthy of it. And so this is what he proposes. And treat me is not the right word here. Uh, Poyasen here is make me. It's like remake me. And as Bailey notes in that form, he says he has a plan that will give him independence from his father and provide an opportunity to compensate for his errors. With pride intact, he intends to order his father to make him a hired servant. Um, and whether he has his pride intact is uh, up to you to discern. He's certainly confessing uh, a sinfulness, and that would not normally be considered part of one's pride. But he is certainly demanding, and we'll hear a similar demand for the rich man to Lazarus at the end of chapter 16, when you think he would also know, like this person, uh, in midst of the flames, that the time for demanding is past. Notice he doesn't say, make me your hired hand. He says, make me like one of your hired hands. What would that imply? To be like one. Is he trying to hold on to some son-like element, like I am still your son, but I want to be tried, treated like an hourly worker? Does he actually expect to get paid? Or is he saying, just give me the amount of bread that your workers get? Uh, it's unclear to us as readers, and perhaps it's unclear to him in his own mind what that means. But it will never be said out loud, as we'll see momentarily. So let's scroll down to finish seeing the end of our chiasm here. So while he was still far off, and that's such a beautiful scene that many commentators, including now and have made a point about, as my note below has, indicating how diligently the father is on the watch for the long-lost son. Also suggesting the son is still, quote-unquote, far off from being fully repentant. But the father saw him and was filled with compassion. And that suggests, although we can't imagine exactly what, that he's been watching for him. We don't know how much time has passed, certainly enough time for him to get to a far country, to spend all the money of an apparently wealthy family full of hired help, uh, and a robe and rings and, all, and the fatted calf and all the things we'll find out next time, uh, and, and make the trip back. So however much time it's been, the father has been watching out at the end of the road to see if he would come. And the moment he sees him, his first response is completely contrary to everything uh, a Roman father would be expected to do here. And as Tannehill notes below, this father reflects the feminine qualities of a God in love with humanity. And similarly, we see from Scott below, this maternal behavior of the father and the maternal theme in the parable are recognized by some as an undertow of the prodigal son parable. Um, and as Dutko, who reads this from a, a Joseph Campbell myth perspective, says, um, this is all felt more powerfully when understanding the archetypal symbols or lack of such as with water in the parable, which to say the archetypal symbol of the father um, chastising the son for doing this, and yet that's not what happens. And not only does he fill with compassion, but he does something completely undignified that almost all uh, scholars note here. He runs. Um, and as my note below, as many ancient testimonies to the lack of dignity for an elderly person to run. And yet again, Sirach establishes the conventional wisdom, as we saw earlier. And there are a number of Sirach passages that establish the conventional wisdom of the father that is exactly the opposite of what he does here. So here we hear a man's attire and open mouth laughter and a man's manner of walking show what he is. Which is to say, in Sirach's mind, he should walk with his head held high in dignity, but instead he runs. And he doesn't put his armors around him. He fell 
on his neck. And again, neck is another thing that will echo into chapter 17. Uh, and it also echoes Joseph falling on his brother um, Benjamin's neck. And um, I'm sorry, let's go back to that and see. Um, yes, he fell on his brother's Benjamin neck and wept while Benjamin fell upon his own neck and wept and he kissed all his brothers. Yet another of the many echoes of the Joseph story uh, here. So the father throws, um, throws himself on his son's neck and kissed him. Um, and uh, as, um, as many uh, note, this is the kind of uh, kissing, as I can say from my note down below, um, from Kiel. This means that he may have placed his cheek on one side of his son's cheek and then his other cheek on the other side of his son's face, as I've re repeatedly seen in Palestine, as you can see in this image, which happens to be from Iraq, but the same idea. And as Bailey notes, the kissing him is as strong an expression of seeking and finding as in the preceding images of the lost sheep and coin. More specifically, the gestures prevent the son from kissing the father's hands or feet, which is to say, acting like the hired help. He's, he's not going to let him say it, and he's not going to let him do it. So despite that, curiously, and maybe it's not curious, maybe it's disastrously, the son continues to give his speech. Uh, and it's his last words in the story. As Ramsey notes below, even after he is greeted warmly by his father, he comes out with a mechanical repetition of the memorized speech exactly as he conceived it in the far country. It gives the appearance of a self-serving stratagem, which underscores the point that is this really repentance? He's experiencing the father running to him. He can certainly see the compassion. He can feel his arms around uh, his neck. And yet all he can do is repeat his speech. Whether he's like a deer in the headlights and he can't process it yet, uh, and he can't believe it's happening, or he's just too incensed to understand that his father is acting completely contrary to father and all is well. So it's going to take more to convince him and we'll see what the father's next step is next time and how the elder son is not happy about this situation. See you for that then. Bye-bye.